This is lecture 1E, and today's topic is going to be acids and bases. In 1884, the uh, Swedish chemist Savante Arrhenius proposed the first definitions ever for acids and bases. People knew that substances had acidic and basic properties, but they didn't know why. And Arrhenius proposed that an acid is any compound that if you dissolve it in water, it produces hydrogen ions in that water solution. That would be a reason for why hydrogen chloride gas, if you bubble it into water, would be an acidic material. When hydrogen chloride is bubbled into water, the water molecules actually tug the HCl molecule, breaking it apart, creating chloride ions, and then creating the species that's responsible for acidic solutions, which are the free hydrogen ions. Arrhenius proposed that a base was any compound that if you dissolve it in water produces hydroxide ions. This would be an explanation for why sodium hydroxide is a basic substance when you take crystals of sodium hydroxide and dissolve it in water, as does all ionic compounds when they dissolve, the ions separate from each other. So when sodium hydroxide dissolves in water, you produce sodium ions and the species responsible for basic solutions, which Arrhenius proposed was the hydroxide ion. Now, acids and bases can have varying strengths. We consider an acid strong if all the molecules release hydrogen ions in solution. If you take something like HCl or HBr or HI, if you put 100 HCLs in water, every single one of them will be ripped apart into hydrogen ions and chloride ions. The same thing for HBr, the same thing for HI. Because that happens 100%, those are considered strong acids. We do have a lot of acids that have oxygens in their formula. Those are called oxyacids. And as long as their formula has at least two more oxygens and hydrogens, then it will behave the same way as HCl, HBr, HI, and 100% ionize. So for example, nitric acid has three O's and one H. That's two more O's and H. This is a strong acid. You put 100 nitric acid molecules in water, all 100 will ionize, producing 100 hydrogen ions. A lot of hydrogen ions in the solution makes it a very acidic solution, so that's considered a strong acid. Sulfuric acid has four O's and two H's, four minus two is two, so it also has two more O's and H's, so we would assume that you put 100 sulfuric acid molecules in water, all 100 would ionize, that's why that's a strong acid. Perchloric acid has three more O's and H's, that means it's a really strong acid. And then carbonic acid, H2CO3, has three O's and two H's. It only has one more O than H, so that means this is not a strong acid. If you put 100 carbonic acid molecules in water, all 100 don't ionize. Only some small number of the carbonic acid molecules ionize, therefore they only produce a few hydrogen ions in solution, so carbonic acid would not be a strong acid. Carbonic acid would be a weak acid, one in which all the molecules do not release hydrogen ions in solution. So that would essentially be all acids other than the ones we outlined above under the category of strong acids. For bases, a strong base is one in which every single formula unit releases a hydroxide ion into solution. And the strong bases that exist are the compounds that contain hydroxides in their formula that are soluble in water. These are ionic compounds, so they would be alkali metal hydroxides like lithium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide. So any of the alkali metal hydroxides, if you dissolve them in water, they completely dissociate. You produce a lot of hydroxides in solution. They make strong bases. In the second column on the periodic table, at the bottom of that column, are the elements calcium, strontium, barium. Those three uh, metals, when they form hydroxide compounds, produce ones that as long as the solutions are dilute, they will create lots of hydroxides in solution, completely dissolving, so they would be considered strong bases as well. So the strong bases are all ionic compounds. They're specifically the ionic compounds that dissolve readily in water. Those would be alkali metal hydroxides, and then calcium, strontium, and barium hydroxide. All other metallic hydroxides are weak bases, and all other covalently bonded molecules that are bases would be weak as well. Weak bases are ones in which the formula units do not release 
hydroxide ions 100% of the time, only some small percent. So that would be all other metallic hydroxide bases, all other covalently bonded substances or bases, but there's only one I would like you to know uh, by memory, and that is ammonia. Ammonia is considered a base, but it's considered a weak base, not considered, it actually is a weak base, because it does not produce a lot of hydroxide ions in solution. Now, if you have metallic hydroxides, spe specifically metallic hydroxides that are in the transition section of the periodic table, they can form different ion charges, so they can form different metallic hydroxides. So for metallic hydroxides, the higher the metal ion's oxidation number, it turns out the less basic its hydroxide is. Chromium, a transition metal, actually forms positive two, positive three, and positive six ions. Therefore, it can form chromium two hydroxide, chromium three hydroxide, and chromium six hydroxide. They theoretically would all be bases, but it turns out the most basic one of these, the one that releases the most hydroxides in solution, is the one with the lowest oxidation number or the lowest metal charge. That would be the chromium two hydroxide. This is the most basic substance of three here. And in fact, if the charge of the metal ion gets really, really high, like the bottom one, chromium-6 hydroxide, if you dissolve this in water, the solution turns out to be acidic instead of basic. The substance in between, where the chromium is a positive 3 charge, is something that is sometimes acting as an acid, sometimes acting as a base. And there's a name for substances that can actually act both as acids and bases, depending upon their situation. We call those amphoteric. Those are substances that can act as an acid or a base. So chromium-3 hydroxide, it turns out, depending on what type of solution you put it in, can be an acid or a base, so it's considered amphoteric. Now, a moment ago, we said that the compound ammonia is a weak base. And the fact that ammonia is a base was something that troubled Svante Arrhenius and the chemists at the time because they couldn't explain why a covalent compound like ammonia should be a base. It doesn't have a hydroxide in its formula to be released, so how can it actually act as a base? And the answer to that came in 1923 by a couple of chemists, one of them, Thomas Lowry. He expanded the definitions of acids and bases that accounted for the fact that ammonia was an actual base. Lowry did this as well as another chemist, Johannes Bronsted, and in fact, quite often now when we talk about these definitions, we call them the Bronsted definitions of acids and bases, where really they're the Bronsted-Lowry definitions. Maybe just Bronsted's good looks won over everybody, and that's why he got all the credit for that. But nonetheless, uh, the definitions they proposed for acids and bases, a more expanded definition, were these. They proposed an acid is a hydrogen ion donor. It's anything that donates a hydrogen ion. I wrote or proton in parentheses there because if you think about what a hydrogen ion is, and to do that, let's go back and think about what a hydrogen atom is. A hydrogen atom has one proton in its nucleus because its atomic number is one and would therefore have one electron. If you remove that electron to create a hydrogen ion, all that's left over is a proton. So quite often, hydrogen ions are referred to as protons, although that tends to make people think that maybe the nucleus is undergoing some change, and it really isn't. So I'm going to try to call them hydrogen ions, but you may hear protons used as a euphemism for hydrogen ion. So the Bronsted-Lowry definitions of acids were any substances that donate hydrogen ions, and they said a base is any substance that accepts a hydrogen ion. So a base is a hydrogen ion or proton acceptor. Let's test these definitions with known acids and bases. We know that HCl is an acid, and Arrhenius proposed that HCl was an acid because when you dissolve it in water, the waters rip the HCl apart into hydrogen ions and chloride ions. We now know that hydrogen ions do not exist independently in a water solution, so that actually couldn't have been true. What Bronsted and Lowry proposed is that when HCl is dissolved in water, an HCl molecule floating around will eventually bump into a water molecule, and what's going to happen is it's going to donate its hydrogen to the water molecule. If the HCl loses a hydrogen ion, it's now negatively charged, and if the water molecule gains a hydrogen ion, it's now positively charged, and its formula now is H3O positive. 
So according to the Bronsted-Lowry definition of acids and bases, HCl is an acid because it donates its hydrogen ion to a water molecule, leaving a chloride ion left over, and you've actually created something that's a new polyatomic ion, H3O positive, which is actually the species that Bronsted and Lowry says is responsible for acidic properties of solutions. And that H3O positive ion is known as the hydronium ion. It's formed whenever a hydrogen ion attaches to a water molecule. Now, the real reason that Bronsted and Lowry had to redefine acids and bases was to explain that, oh, let me just say one more thing here. In this reaction, when HCl is acting as an acid because it's donating a hydrogen ion to the water, what's the water molecule doing? The water molecule is accepting that hydrogen ion. What's the definition of something that accepts a hydrogen ion? It's a base. So whenever you have an acid reacting, there's going to have to be a base corresponding to it because if the, if the acid gives up its hydrogen ion, there has to be another species accepting it, and that species would be a base. Now, what Bronsted and Lowry were trying to explain is why something like a, ammonia wasn't actually a basic substance, because the Arrhenius definition wouldn't have explained that. So it appeared the Arrhenius was erroneous with its definitions of acids and bases, and thus Bronsted and Lowry came up with these more broad definitions. So they said if you put ammonia in water and the ammonia molecule eventually bumps into a water molecule, the ammonia molecule will attract the hydrogen ion from the water and take it from it. And if it's gained a hydrogen ion, it's now going to be positively charged, and if the water molecule's lost the hydrogen ion, it's going to be negatively charged you've created an ammonium ion and a hydroxide ion, and it's still the hydroxide ion that's the species in a solution that causes things to be basic, but this is why you get a hydroxide ion when ammonia is dissolved in water, is because ammonia is actually pulling a hydrogen ion off of the water molecule that creates a hydroxide ion from that. In this reaction, the ammonia is taking a hydrogen from the water, so therefore it's acting as a base, What's the water doing in this reaction? The water is donating its hydrogen ion to the ammonia. What's that called? That's called an acid. So in this case, when ammonia reacts with water, ammonia acts as a base. Water in this case is acting as acid. So we've seen two examples in a row, one where water acts as a base, the other where water acts as an acid. That means water is an amphoteric substance. Now, when a Bronsted acid base reaction occurs, and you see one right at the top of the slide here, it just means a hydrogen ion gets transferred from the acid to the base. When a Bronsted acid base reaction occurs, the acid turns itself into a base, and the base turns itself into an acid. And let's look at the first example we had done a couple of moments ago. When HCl is dissolved in water, it donates its hydrogen ion to the water, and it creates a chloride ion, and a hydronium ion. In this case, we can identify HCl as the acid because going from left to right in the reaction, the HCl is losing a hydrogen. That's what acids do, they lose hydrogens. What's the water doing going from the left side of the equation to the right side? It's gaining a hydrogen. What gains hydrogens? Bases do. So this reaction is an acid-base reaction. And what Bronsted and Lowry are also saying is that when you produce these products, the chloride ion and the hydronium ion, those are acids and bases as well. And to visualize that, let's imagine the reaction going in the reverse direction. Going in the reverse direction, what's the hydronium ion doing as it's going from H3O plus over to the left side of the equation, H2O? It's losing a hydrogen. What's it called if you lose a hydrogen? You're an acid. So H3O positive is actually an acid. What did it come from? It came from the water. So we call it the conjugate acid of H2O. So if you have something acting as a base like water, whatever it turns into will be its conjugate acid. So H3O plus is the conjugate acid of water. Look at the chloride ion and imagine it going from the right side of the equation to the left side. What's it doing? It's gaining a hydrogen. Things again, hydrogens are bases, so the chloride ion is a base. What did it come from? It came from the HCl, so we call it the conjugate base of HCl. 
If we look at the second reaction that we had dealt with, the ammonia and water reaction, reading this from left to right, the ammonia is gaining a hydrogen going from left to right. It's acting as a base. The water is losing a hydrogen going from left to right. It's acting as an acid. So we're going to try to predict what is the acid, what is the base on the product side. So if we take the hydroxide ion, what does the hydroxide ion do if you imagine the reaction going in the reverse direction? It's gaining a hydrogen. Who gains hydrogens? Bases do. So hydroxide must be a base. And if you just identify what it came from, then you have a complete name for that. It's the conjugate base of water because it's the base that water turns into when water acts as an acid. The NH4 positive going from right to left is losing a hydrogen, it's acting as an acid. So therefore the ammonia turned into the conjugate acid of ammonia, which is ammonium. This is the conjugate acid of NH3. Now, in terms of strengths of acids and bases, if a particular acid like HCl loses its hydrogen ions 100% because it's a strong acid, you can then deduce something about the strength of its conjugate base. So if an acid like HCl loses hydrogens 100% of the time, what can you conclude about what Cl- does as a base? Cl- would have to gain hydrogens 0% of the time. Think about why that is. If you had a chloride ion at the top reaction here, and you made it go in the reverse direction, gain a hydrogen and form an HCl, what does the HCl immediately do? Breaks apart again. So HCLs don't stick together. That means the chloride ion doesn't accept hydrogens at all. So if you ever have an acid that's a strong acid, which means it loses hydrogen ions 100% of the time, its conjugate base will gain hydrogens 0% of the time. Now ammonia in the second reaction is a weak base. What does that mean? If a base is like ammonia and it's weak, that means it gains hydrogens to some small percent. I'll just write less than 100. It could be 5%, it could be 50%, but it's less than that. So if a base or an acid, but if anything uh, does something less than 100%, its conjugate will do the same. So its conjugate acid must lose hydrogens less than 100% as well. So there's a relationship here, strong acids, will have conjugate bases that don't react as bases at all. If you had a weak acid, it would have a conjugate base that would be weak. For bases, if you have a weak base, its conjugate acid must be weak. But if you have a base that's strong, that means its conjugate acid must not act as an acid at all. So strong acids lose their hydrogens 100% of the time. Therefore, their conjugate bases are really not even bases at all. I'm gonna call them non-conjugate bases because they gain hydrogens 0%. So strong acids always have non-conjugate bases. If you were to have a weak acid, which loses hydrogens less than 100% of the time, then that means it's gonna have a weak conjugate base because it's also gonna do things less than 100%. As a base, it's gonna wind up gaining hydrogens less than 100%. So in terms of conjugation, strong acids have non-conjugate bases, Weak acids have weak conjugate bases. And if you do the same thing for bases, if you have a strong base, you can conclude that its conjugate acid is going to lose hydrogen 0% of the time. So we're going to say it's a non-conjugate acid. And if you have a weak base, which means it gains hydrogens less than 100% of the time, it's going to have a weak conjugate base. So these are the relationships you'll need to understand. If a component is strong, its conjugate will be non. If a component is weak, its conjugate will also be weak. Let's do some predictions based upon that. Let's see if we can determine what the conjugate base of HClO4 is. If perchloric acid has a conjugate base, that means HClO4 must be acting as an acid. So if they ever ask you what's the conjugate base, that means you're thinking about this compound acting as an acid. So when it acts as an acid, according to Bronsted-Lowry, it loses a hydrogen ion to water. If it loses a hydrogen ion, then that means when it acts as an acid, it becomes ClO4-. That's going to be its conjugate base. 
So the conjugate base is whatever you get when the acid loses a hydrogen ion. Now, what kind of acid is HClO4? It has three more O's than H's in its formula. It's a really strong acid. So if that's a strong acid, what can you conclude about the, the perchlorate ion as a base? It's gonna be a non-base. The HClO4 will lose its hydrogen ions 100% of the time. ClO4 minus will accept hydrogens 0% of the time, so it really isn't even a base. Let me ask you what the conjugate acid of CH3NH2 would be. Here's something you've never seen before. It looks like a really bizarre formula. How do you answer this question? If they're asking you what the conjugate acid is, that means the substance must be acting as a base. So then all you have to do is figure out what is CH3NH2 going to turn into when it acts as a base. When it acts as a base, bases gain hydrogen, so this is going to gain a hydrogen ion. You stick one more hydrogen on the formula. Now you can put it anywhere you want at the very beginning. You can make it CH4NH2. You can make it CH3NH3. Either would be fine. In all reality, the extra hydrogen bonds to the nitrogen, so the correct formula would be CH3NH3. And because you're gaining a hydrogen ion which is positive, the overall charge will be positive. But as long as you have a carbon, a nitrogen, six hydrogens, and a plus one charge, then that would be acceptable as the formula for the conjugate acid of CH3NH2. Now, in terms of strengths, what kind of base is CH3NH2? Well, it's not one of the strong bases we talked about. Those were only the alkali metal hydroxides and then calcium, strontium, and barium hydroxide. All other bases are considered weak bases. So if this is a weak base, what can you conclude about its conjugate acid? It has to be weak as well. Now, if you have a beaker of pure water, in all reality, you do not have a beaker of pure water because what water molecules do as they're floating around and bumping into each other is when they bump into each other, sometimes they will cause a slight reaction to occur. So water ionizes itself, but only to a very, very small extent. Let me show you that ionization that takes place. If you have a beaker of water and two water molecules are on a collision course and they're gonna bump into each other, what can occasionally happen is when they bump, a hydrogen gets transferred from one water molecule to the other. That creates a hydronium ion and a hydroxide ion. So in water, you will occasionally have two water molecules bumping into each other and having a hydrogen ion transferred, creating the hydronium ion and the hydroxide ion. The hydronium ion is the species that makes solutions acidic. The hydroxide ion is the species that makes solution basic. Whenever water ionizes itself, it actually forms equal amounts of hydroniums and hydroxides. So therefore, pure water is neither acidic nor basic. We actually have a name for that. We call it neutral. So when you have equal amounts of hydroniums and hydroxides, that makes a solution neutral, and therefore pure water would be neutral. Now, this particular process for the two, two water molecules turning into a hydronium and hydroxide ion is an endothermic process. It requires energy. So if we want to indicate that in our balanced equation, because this reaction actually is an equilibrium. The waters turn into hydro hydronium and hydroxide ions. Hydroniums and hydroxides can bump into each other, turn back into two waters, and you actually get an equilibrium established. And this equilibrium reaction is an endothermic process. Now, let's see if we know it's an equilibrium, can we write the equilibrium constant expression for this reaction? Equilibrium constant expressions in terms of molarities would be the molarities of the products over the molarities of the reactants. So our products are hydronium ion and hydroxide ion, and our reactant is a liquid, so that does not appear in the expression. So the equilibrium constant expression for this reaction would be hydronium ion molarity multiplied by hydroxide ion molarity. Just the rules we've used as in the last chapter for writing equilibrium constant expressions. But because this is a very specific reaction, it's the auto ionization of water, this particular equilibrium constant for this reaction has been given its own characteristic name. It's called the ion product constant for water, and it's abbreviated KW. So when you write the equilibrium constant expression for the ionization of water, the equilibrium constant is not written KEQ or KC or 
not kp, but it's written kw. It's the specific equilibrium constant for the ionization of water. And as we said moment, a few moments ago, the ionization of water is an endothermic process. So if you want to indicate that in the equation above, you can put energy on the reactant side. And because of that, as you change the temperature, the equilibrium constant for this reaction will change. And we can figure out how that would work. If we look at different temperatures and look at what the different KW values are, we're going to look at 20, 25, and 30. At 20 degrees Celsius, which is about 68 degree water, uh, we find that the equilibrium constant for this particular reaction is 0.68 times 10 to the minus 14th. Now, if we raise the temperature, what would we expect? If you raise the temperature, you're adding energy to the system. Energy's on the reactant side. If you add something to the reactant side, you've got to get rid of it. So Le Chatelier's principle says the forward reaction will become spontaneous to get rid of that excess energy. If the forward reaction is spontaneous, you'll be building up more products, which means your numerator will be bigger, your equilibrium constant will be larger. So as we warm water up to 25 degrees Celsius, which is quite commonly considered room temperature water, the KW value is going to be a larger number. And in fact, it comes out to be to three significant figures, 1.00 times 10 to the minus 14th. If we warm up water to 30 degrees Celsius, the reaction would shift more to the right, you would have more products, and the Kw would be even a larger number, 1.47 times 10 to the minus 14th. So this particular constant is dependent upon the temperature, and what we're going to do for most of this semester is we're going to assume that any solutions we deal with are going to be room temperature solutions, that they'll be at 25 degrees Celsius. And if they are, then we can assume the Kw for water at room temperature is 1.00 times 10 to the minus 14th. Let's show how that can be helpful. We're going to see if we can find the hydronium and hydroxide molarities in pure water at 25 degrees Celsius. So the hydroniums and hydroxides are in equilibrium with the water molecules that bump into each other to form them. If we write the reaction for the equilibrium, the two liquid water molecules, in equilibrium with a hydronium and a hydroxide ion. If we want to calculate what the hydronium and hydroxide concentrations are, that means when the system has reached equilibrium, we're going to write an ice table for that. Initial molarities, change in molarities, equilibrium molarities. So before the water molecules bump into each other, there aren't any hydroniums or hydroxides. But because there are lots of liquid water molecules in the container, they can bump into each other. The only reaction that could be spontaneous is the forward reaction. I'm not going to write anything under my liquid because liquids don't appear in equilibrium constant expressions. But if I'm forming hydroniums and hydroxides, their change in molarities will be coefficients in the balanced equation plus 1x plus 1x. Add those columns. The equilibrium molarities of hydroniums and hydroxides in water have to be x and x. Much like any other equilibrium problem we've been doing, you then write the equilibrium constant expression for this reaction. And generically, you could write Kc equals hydroniums times hydroxides. But because this is the ionization for water, the equilibrium constant is given its special name, Kw. And at 25 degrees Celsius, we know the Kw is 1.00 times 10 to the minus 14th. We actually have the units of molarity squared. That's going to equal the product of the two equilibrium molarities of the hydroniums and the hydroxides, which are x and x. So x times x is x squared. You just take the square root of both sides of the equation. x is going to be 1.00 times 10 to the minus 7th molar. That's going to be the concentration of hydronium ions and the concentration of hydroxide ions in pure water. So this is a pretty small number. This is 1 10 millionth of a molar. Hydronium and hydroxide concentrations tend to be very small, and because these are tediously small numbers to deal with, scientists have developed a different way to represent the concentration of hydronium ions in a solution where the numbers aren't quite so microscopic like 10 to the minus 7th. And we call that the pH scale. pH, the symbol, is a lowercase p, which stands for power of, and the H stands for the hydrogen. So it's the power of the hydrogen concentration is really what that's trying to say. And technically what we do is we take the negative of the logarithm of the hydronium ions of a solution because a logarithm is a power. And if we want to go back and spend a couple of minutes just talking about what logarithms are, 
If you do a logarithm with a base 10, that's called a common logarithm. And the common logarithm of a number is always a power. It's the exponent to which 10 must be raised to equal that particular number. And let me just show you a couple of simple examples. Let's say we have the number 100. Well, how could you write 100 to, as 10 to some power? 100 could be expressed as 10 to the second power. So that little exponent there, that 2, that exponent is the logarithm of 100. So we would say the log of 100 equals 2. Now, the next number, 0 0.01, how could you represent that as 10 to some power? That would be represented as 10 to the negative 2. So that negative 2 up there, that is the logarithm of 0 0.01. The logarithm of 0 0.01 is negative 2. And for the third example, if you have 0 0.001, how could you represent that as 10 to some power? That would be 10 to the minus third. So the exponent is the logarithm. So the logarithm of 0 0.001 is negative 3. And these last two readings are more similar to what hydronium concentrations are in solution. They're small, 0 0.01, 0 0.001. So what we do to express how acidic a solution is, what its hydronium concentration is, is we write it as 10 to a power. We take that logarithm, in this case, either the negative 2 or the negative 3, and then according to the definition above, we take the negative of that. So the negative of each of those would be respectively 2 and 3. So if you have a solution whose pH is 2, that means its hydronium concentration is 0 0.01 molar. If you have a solution whose pH is 3, its hydronium concentration is 0 0.001 molar. Just an easier way to represent the concentration of the hydronium ions. What if you have something like this, 0 0.002? How do you represent that as 10 raised to some power? And the answer is, use your calculator because that can't be done in your head. So if you put 0 0.002 in your calculator and you press log, what it's really doing is it's figuring out what do I have to raise 10 to to equal 0 0.002? And your calculator will determine that has to be negative 2.699. So it will tell you that the logarithm of 0 0.002 is negative 2.699. So if you had a solution whose hydronium concentration was 0 0.002, and if you want to express it as a pH, you would take the log of that, which would be the negative 2.699, and then to make it a pH, you take the negative of that number, and so the pH would be positive, 2.699. Now, if we want to represent the hydroxide concentration in a similar fashion, we can. We can take what's called the pOH. That means the power of the hydroxide concentration, and a power is a logarithm. So it's just going to be the logarithm of the hydroxide concentration in the solution, but we're going to take the negative of that, so our answers come out mostly positive. So let's try some examples of calculating pHs if we understand this concept. Let's calculate the pH of orange juice if its hydronium ion concentration is 2.5 times 10 to the minus fourth molar. So 2.5 times 10 to the minus fourth molar is one way to represent the hydronium ion concentration, but another way is by pH. So all we have to do is take the logarithm of 2.5 times 10 to the minus fourth, and whatever answer we get, change the sign. And if you do this on your calculator, you'll get the log is negative 3.6, and the negative of that would be positive 3.6. Everything looks fine, but when you're dealing with logarithms, it turns out that you have now written the answer with an incorrect number of significant figures, and let me show you why that is. When you take the logarithm of 2.5 times 10 to the minus fourth, you're actually taking the logarithm of two different things, the 2.5, and the 10 to the minus fourth. So the log of 2.5 must be calculated, and then you're going to add that to the log of 10 to the minus fourth. So let's see what those are. This is a two significant figure number, and 10 to the minus fourth, that exponent up there, that's not a measurement. Exponents are not measured values. They don't have significant figures. They're exact. So now when I calculate my logs of each of these numbers, the log of 2.5 should be a two significant figure, so that comes out 0 0.40. The log of 10 to the minus fourth is negative four, but it's an exact number, so we can write that 4.000000, and those zeros continue forever. To get my answer now, what is the pH of the solution, I need to add those two numbers together. This is going to be an addition problem. So watch when you add 0 0.40 
and negative 4.000 indefinitely. You have 0 0.40, adding it to negative 4.000. And if you notice, when you do addition or subtraction, you go by how many places past the decimal point the number is written. And because the 0 0.40 is accurate two places past the decimal point, when you add this, you're going to be able to write your answer two places past the decimal point. So the logarithm of 2.5 times 10 to the minus fourth written with the right number of significant figures is actually negative 3.60. And now when you take the negative of that, the pH is positive 3.60. So, wow, that's a lot of work, right? Let me make it a little bit simpler for you. Whenever you have a pH, which is a logarithmic number, in actuality, the only significant figures are the digits past the decimal point. So when you press your calculator to get a pH, don't count the numbers in front of the decimal point as significant figures. Don't count the three. So if you need two significant figures, you'll need two places past the decimal point. So here, the six and the zero are significant figures, but as, as it being a logarithmic number, the digits to the left of the decimal point do not count. So for logarithmic numbers, only the digits after the decimal point are significant figures, not the digits before. Let's see if we can calculate the pH and pOH of pure water at 25 degrees Celsius. Now for pure water, we actually calculated a few moments ago what the hydronium and hydroxide concentrations were. The hydronium ion concentration was 1.00 times 10 to the minus seventh. So if that's the hydronium concentration, we can calculate the pH by taking the negative log of that. So we're going to take the negative log of 1.00 times 10 to the minus 7. If you do that in your calculator, you will get negative 7. And to take the negative of that, you'll get positive 7. Now we have to write it to the correct number of significant figures. So 1.00 times 10 to the minus 7th is a molarity that's three significant figures. Now when I write my pH, which is a logarithmic number, the only significant figures are past the decimal point, so I need to have three digits past the decimal point. So that would be 7.000. To calculate the pOH of pure water, we know the hydroxide concentration from before was 1.00 times 10 to the minus seventh. So the pOH is just the negative logarithm of the hydroxide concentration. So if we take the negative log of 1.00 times 10 to the minus seventh, we get the same answer as before, seven. But 1.00 times 10 to the minus seventh being a three significant figure number means when we write it as a logarithmic answer and POH is a logarithmic answer, we need three places past the decimal point. So it's gonna be 7.000. Now, in any water solution, you always reach an equilibrium between the water molecules and the hydronium and hydroxide ions. And therefore, the KW value is always going to equal the product of the hydroniums and the hydroxide molarities. At 25 degrees Celsius, we know what the KW is. At 25 degrees Celsius, it's 1.00 times 10 to the minus 14. So that means at room temperature, 1.00 times 10 to the minus 14th will always equal the hydronium molarity times the hydroxide molarity. So if you wanted to calculate or solve for the hydroxide molarity in the solution and you know the hydronium ion molarity, you can do that. As long as you know one of the two variables on the right side of the equation, you can find the other. So if I know the hydrogen ion molarity or the hydronium ion molarity rather, I can solve for the hydroxide molarity by just by going 1.00 times 10 to the minus 14th divided by the hydronium ion concentration. So for example, in orange juice, if we know that the hydronium concentration is 2.5 times 10 to the minus fourth, we can figure out what the hydroxide concentration has to be. It has to be 1.00 times 10 to the minus 14th divided by 2.5 times 10 to the minus fourth. This comes out the hydroxide molarity, which to two significant figures is 4.0 times 10 to the minus 11th. Has to be. Now, when you deal with pHs, <clears throat> we quite often see the pH scale represented as going from 0 to 14. So what do these numbers actually mean? If you're exactly at a pH of 7, as we saw with neutral water, that's when the, hy the hydronium ion molarity and the hydroxide ion molarity are the same. They're both 1 times 10 to the minus 7th. So at a pH of 7, the hydronium concentration is 1 times 10 to the minus 7th. 
the hydroxide concentration is 1 times 10 to the minus 7th. And as long as the hydronium and hydroxide molarities are equal, this solution is called neutral. Notice what those two multiply to make. 10 to the minus 7th times 10 to the minus 7th multiply to make 10 to the minus 14th. That's always going to be true. Now, if a pH is less than 7, that means the solution is acidic. And if a pH is greater than 7, that means it's basic. That's a fundamental concept you need to understand about pHs. Let's see why that is. What if you're at a pH of 3? What is the hydronium ion concentration in a pH of 3? Well, if you take the negative of 3, that's the exponent that 10 must be raised to to equal the hydronium concentration. So the hydronium concentration is 10 raised to the negative 3 molarity. If that's the concentration of the hydronium ions at a pH of 3, so it's easy to calculate, can you tell me what the hydroxide ion molarity has to be? Remembering they have to multiply to make 10 to the minus 14th, if this is the hydronium ion molarity, the hydroxide ion molarity must be 10 to the minus 11th. Which one is bigger? The hydronium ion molarity is bigger, and if you have more hydronium ions and hydroxides, that's what makes a solution acidic. If you're at a pH of 12, you can determine the hydronium ion concentration by going 10 raised to the negative pH as a power. So 10 to the negative 12th would be the molarity of the hydronium ions in a solution whose pH is 12. If that's the hydronium ion molarity, what's the hydroxide ion molarity? They have to multiply to make 10 to the minus 14th. It would have to be 10 to the minus second. And in this case, the hydroxide ion concentration is way bigger than the hydroniums. That's why this solution is basic. So when pHs are above 7, you always have a higher hydroxide concentration than hydronium. When the pHs are less than 7, you always have a higher hydronium ion concentration than hydroxide. That's why those are acidic. Now, pHs don't stop at 0 and 14. You can actually have pHs go down into the negative range, and you can have pHs go up into the range above 14 up to 15. What does that mean if you have a pH of negative 1? Well, it means the hydronium ion concentration is 10 raised to the negative of the pH value. So 10 raised to the negative of a negative 1 means the hydronium ion concentration is 10 to the first. That means 10 molar. That's almost the right concentration for concentrated hydrochloric acid. So concentrated hydrochloric acid is actually 12 molar, but it's really close to 10 molar. And so if you actually tested the pH of concentrated hydrochloric acid, it would be negative 1. So you can have negative pHs. What would have to be the hydroxide ion concentration in the solution? Remembering that hydroniums and hydroxides must multiply to make 10 to the minus 14th, the only way this will work is if hydroxides get to be such a small number, they're 10 to the minus 15th. So this is how the pH scale works. We already know now that for any water solution, the product of the hydronium ion and the hydroxide ion concentrations equal the Kw. Let me make one additional relationship based upon this equation. I'm going to take the logarithm of both sides of this equation. Take the log of the Kw and then the log of the hydroniums multiplied by the hydroxides. Then I'm going to multiply the entire equation by negative 1. So I'm going to have negative log of Kw equals negative log of hydroniums times hydroxides. On the right side of the equation, if you're taking the log of two numbers that are multiplied, that's equivalent to taking the log of one and adding it to the log of the other. If I distribute the negative sign in front, they'll actually be subtracted. So by rule of logs, I'm going to uh, simplify the right side of the equation by saying that's going to be the negative log of hydroniums plus the negative log of hydroxides. Why did I do that? What's the negative log of hydroniums? pH. What's the negative log of hydroxides? pOH. So the right side of the equation is pH plus pOH. You see the left side of the equation? I'm taking the negative log of the Kw. I can abbreviate that as pKw, because whenever you have a lowercase p followed by something, you're saying take the negative log of that. So the very equation at the top of the slide here, if you take the logarithm of it, you get a related equation that says the pKw must equal pH plus pOH. And if we know that the Kw is 1.00 times 10 to the minus 14th at 25 degrees Celsius, the negative log of that is 14.000. 
Therefore, any water solution at room temperature, pH plus pOH is always going to equal 14.000. So just another relationship that's going to be useful. And let's do a couple of examples now to finish this up. We're going to calculate the pH and the pOH of soda if its hydronium ion concentration is 1.6 times 10 to the minus third. So if you know the hydronium ion concentration of a solution, the easiest thing to calculate of the two is the pH. It's just the negative log of that number. So if the pH equals the negative log of the hydronium ion concentration, I'm going to take the negative log of 1.6 times 10 to the minus third molar. I'll get my answer. The answer should be two significant figures. How do you write a logarithmic number to two significant figures? You write it two places past the decimal point. So the pH value should be 2.80. If I now know the pH of the solution, the easier way to get the pOH is to use this relationship here. pH plus pOH equals pKW. The pOH will equal the pKW minus the pH. And if I know the pKW is 14 and the pH is 2.8, I just have to subtract those. And the 2.80 is only accurate two places past the decimal point. So my answer will be written two places past the decimal point. So that'll come out 11.20 as the pOH of this solution. Let's do one final calculation. Let's go the other way around. Let's calculate the hydronium ion concentration of blood which has a pH of 7.4. So I'm giving you the pH. I want you to go backwards and calculate the hydronium ion concentration. So slight chance for error in this one. Here's the important thing to do. When you're trying to solve for the hydronium concentration, and right now this equation says you're taking the log of it, the first thing you do is you divide both sides by negative one. So essentially you're moving the negative sign to the other side of the equation. That'll make it way easier. Now to get the hydronium concentration, you need to take the anti-log of both sides of the equation. So the left side will be the anti-log of negative pH, and on the right side, the anti-log of a log will cancel out and you'll just get the hydronium ion concentration. Now what does anti-log actually mean? It means raised to 10 as a base. So you would go the negative pH, which would be negative 7.4, make that the exponent above 10. That's physically what you'd be doing. Your calculator will either you do the second function log or your calculator may actually say 10 to the x on it right above your log key. Those are anti-logs. So if you take the anti-log of negative 7.4, you're going to wind up getting the hydronium ion concentration, which comes out a really small number. That's why we use pHs. It's way more convenient than saying, oh, my solution is 0.000000398 molar. Now, you could make that a little bit simpler by writing in scientific notation, 3.98 times 10 to the minus eighth molar. But let's think about how many significant figures we should write for this, okay? Look at your pH, 7.4. How many significant figures is your pH? Remember, that's a logarithmic number. The seven doesn't count. Only the four is a significant figure. So for logarithmic numbers, only the digits after the decimal point are significant. Therefore, this is a one significant figure number. So now when you calculate the hydronium ion molarity, which is not a logarithmic number, you want to write it normally as one significant figure. So 3.98 times 10 to the minus eighth would be rounded to four times 10 to the minus eighth molar. And that would be the concentration of the hydronium ions in blood written to the correct number of significant figures.